and she said that they were going to be filming for my scam presentation, and I was like, what, you think my presentation's a scam? Like, no, it's not it. So, yeah, I'm real. I'm here. Um, so thanks so much for coming out. My name is Monica. Um, I used to work at the school Public Library. I was the administrative assistant to the director there, um, and while I was there, I headed up our green committee and just was really into sustainability and ways to make the library more sustainable. Um, and so they asked me to put together a program on zero waste, and so I did for that library, um, and it was pretty popular, and so I just sort of started doing the library circuit, and I've been doing these programs um, ever since, uh, a couple of, since a couple of years ago when I started. So, um, so it's so nice to come and visit other libraries and see what all um, everyone is doing here and, and sharing this information. So um, I'm going to talk about the zero waste mindset. If you're not familiar with what zero waste is, it's the concept of trying to reduce the amount of waste that we um, create in our lives. Um, you might have seen that there's people who like put all their garbage from one year in a jar. That's not me. Uh, that's not what I expect from you. Um, so don't worry. Like don't feel like this is already not going to be something you can achieve. Um, my goal today is I'm going to share some information and some facts about trash and recycling and things like that, and then um, a bunch of tips. Um, of things that I've done in my home and things that you guys can do and changes that you can make in your lives to reduce the amount of waste that you create. So um, so feel free to raise your hand and ask questions or comment and throughout. Um, I don't mind or you can wait till the end. Um, either way is fine. And then you have a handout. Um, that handout was meant to be an e-handout. Not, I did not want to print it out. Um, <laughs> but you have it now so feel free to just take notes. But there's um, links on it which clearly you cannot click on. So um, Donna will email that out to all of you if you signed up online and if you didn't, um, just be sure to give her your email address after so that she can send it to you because that way you can click on the links for all the different things that are there. So, all right. So first, uh, the depressing stuff. So some facts about trash. So according to the EPA, uh, as of the last study in 2018, People in the U.S. were generating about 4.9 pounds of waste per person per day for a total of 292.4 million tons. So that's just the United States. 50% uh, of that waste is landfilled, uh, which is this giant pile of garbage that you see here. Um, paper is the largest component of that at about 23%. Uh, food accounts for about 21.6%. And then yard trimmings, weirdly enough, are the next largest category at 12% tying with plastics, also 12%. The good news is that over time, our recycling and composting rates have increased from just over 6% of all of the waste that generated in 1960 to 32% in 2018 when we had the last study. Um, and about 12% of our waste is now being combusted with energy recovery. So that means that waste is being burned and that decreases obviously the volume of solid waste that's going into a landfill. And in addition, there's energy generated during that combustion process and they are able to recover that energy. So it creates a renewable energy source and then reduces carbon emissions by offsetting the energy from fossil sources and then reducing methane generation that comes from landfills. So I thought that was really interesting. It was, it was a new thing that I had learned and a great way to deal with some of the problem of the waste that we do have. Um, and then the disposal of waste to landfills has decreased from about 94% of what we were generating in 1960 to about 50% of the amount generated in 2018. But for comparison, in case you were feeling really good about yourself, uh, Sweden's numbers, just 1% of the trash in the country goes to landfills, 52% of it is used to produce energy, and 47% is recycled. So, uh, we've got a long way to go. And then, I have a little bit of a depressing video here. These are plastic bottles on the ocean floor in Taiwan. More bad news. 
50% of our garbage is not being recycled. And a lot of times when we think that our items are being recycled, it turns out that they're actually just being landfilled or burned or stockpiled. So we do tend to do something that's called wish cycling, where you think that you're doing a really good job because you put something in your recycling bin and you're like, yay, I recycled. But that's just the beginning of the process. And if you didn't rinse it, or is it a wrong number plastic, or it was too small of a piece, or whatever it was, that's not getting recycled. Um, so part of the reason for this was that China used to be the largest buyer of US plastic waste, but now only about half of that plastic waste that we used to export is still being accepted by foreign markets. So we used to have, there was an economic incentive to recycle, and when we did recycle, we, had, we were getting paid for that recycling, and so there were people that could sort through our garbage, so if we didn't do a good job about the rinsing or this or that, people could sort through it and it would be okay, but now, where there aren't, there isn't an economic incentive, and so a lot of times they're like, "Oh, you put this, you contaminate." That's what they call it. You contaminated your recycling. We're just going to toss it out in the garbage because that's easier and cheaper. Um, so this is why what I'm going to talk about in recycling is like the last thing on this on this spectrum of things that we should be doing because it doesn't always work. Um, so this happened. That happened in 2018, where China stopped taking our plastic, and so now the equivalent of 19,000 shipping containers of plastic recycling per month is now stranded in the United States, and that's enough to fill 250 Olympic-sized swimming pools each month. And then, because we couldn't find China didn't want our waste anymore, we started sending it to other third-world countries. So Malaysia, for example, recently sent back 150 shipping containers of plastic waste to rich countries including the US, the UK, France, Canada, saying we're not going to be the world's garbage dump anymore. And during the first seven months of 2018, after China stopped taking our plastic, the plastic waste exported from the US to Malaysia had more than doubled compared to the previous year. And then most plastics were actually never possible to recycle at all. Um, as we saw, one study found that only 9% of the plastic ever produced has been recycled. <coughs> Um, and there's a documentary that I link on the form, on the handout, um, about the plastics industry, and it's really the petroleum industry, and how they knew from the get-go that plastic was, that recycling wasn't going to be an option, but they wanted to sell us on it. And so they were like, oh yeah, you could just recycle it, and it's fine, and feel good about yourself. But they knew that that wasn't actually going to be a viable solution. So very interesting how much is behind all of this. Um, and I just read a study recently that actually found in human bodies, like, people had microplastics in their organisms. Like we're breathing it, we're ingesting it, like it's everywhere now, so pretty bad. Um, and plastics obviously are like one of the biggest culprits. So what can we do about it? So there are five concepts of zero waste. I think the three in the middle, everybody's heard of, right? Reduce, reuse, recycle. Um, but we have a couple more to add to it. Refuse, which is saying no to things that are not essential. Um, Reducing, adopting minimalist tendencies, trying to have less stuff in general. Reusing, giving things a second life or having using things that are reusable as opposed to disposable. If we do need to buy something in disposable packaging, prioritizing recyclable packaging. And then rot, which has to do with composting. So what are we going to get out of it? So as humans, right, we can all sit here and say, well, we just want to save the earth. But we also need our selfish human beings, right? So we need our intrinsic reasons to do things. So um, one of those things is it's just healthier to practice zero waste or to try to reduce the amount of waste. If we stop using things that are plastic, we stop inhaling and um, consuming these harmful substances called BPAs and phthalates. They might have heard of, the, like, you'll see a lot of plastic things now that say BPA-free. Um, these chemicals cause cancer early puberty in girls, infertility in boys, hyperactivity, neurological conditions, even obesity and type 2 diabetes. So um, if we can avoid those, uh, the, using those plastics, we can avoid some of those harmful things. Um, generally, when you use uh, things that are less processed and less packaged, those are things that have less chemicals anyway, so they're going to be better for you. Um, if you replace processed and junk food that tends to come in plastic packaging, uh, frozen meals, for example, that are in a plastic tray with a plastic sheet and a cardboard box, right, all of that. Um, you replace that with real food, obviously that's going to be more nutritious for you anyway. Or drinking water instead of buying juice or soda that comes in a container. And then we save money. So the idea is we consume less and buy only what we need to replace, but not things to add to our inventory. Um, processed foods are more expensive than preparing the same thing from scratch. It's all about quality over quantity, so it might be more expensive at first um, to buy something that's reusable, but obviously you're going to save money in the long run as opposed to having to keep buying and buying things that are disposable. 
Um, and then in general, having less things is more money in our pocket because it's just costly to store and maintain and repair the more things that you have. So the first R is refuse. Um, so we just need to say, just say no, right? But we're not talking about drugs in the 80s. We're talking about all of these kinds of like cheap plastic freebie things. So everybody's got a cabinet full of stuff like that, right? Everybody's gotten like the beer koozie and the free t-shirt and the calculator that doesn't work, right? Um, we, it's hard to say no to those things because they're free and we all want free stuff. Um, but we have to kind of retrain our brains to do that and to just uh, and it's not about replacing plastics with greener alternatives. So there was a, a period of time, for example, when people were saying like, oh, we're not going to use straws anymore, but then they were giving us paper straws, where they had to cut down a tree to make this paper straw. So it's not about trying to replace one with the other, right? It's just taking, getting rid of it to start with. But if they're not actually composting them, then there's no point in them being compostable. And actually, um, some of them have chemicals and things that are not, even, that are not good either. So, um, so that's not a good solution. Um, Single-use plastics and other like disposable items and things like freebies, uh, hotel toiletries, party favors, swag, that kind of stuff is tempting, but we have to remember that it's usually really low quality, um, produced at a low cost, which means they probably have those harmful substances I was talking about, those BPAs and those phthalates, um, and were manufactured at the cost of workers, right? I mean, if you're buying some you know, piece of plastic that costs you 50 cents, you can imagine how much money the person who's making it is, um, was making. So, um, And then there's saying no to things like this plastic cutlery at a restaurant. You know, Now there's so many ways you can just take a couple, you know, a fork and a knife from your house, bring it with you when you go to a restaurant. You don't have to worry about having to use the plastic because that's the only option. Um, it's easy enough to do something like that. Um, you don't have to take a candelabra, that's totally optional, but depending how fancy you want to get. Um, and then another refuse idea, and all of these I'm going to mention, like some websites and links, and again, it's all on the handout, so don't worry about like, writing stuff down. Um, but junk mail is another thing that we can refuse. So a lot of times we get catalogs and stuff in the mail, and you literally put it from the mailbox into your recycling bin, right? But instead of doing that, you can get off of those mailing lists. And there's a website called catalogchoice.org, where it's a one-stop shop for you to put in your information. Um, and you'll get off of all of those mailing lists at once, instead of doing what I used to do, which was calling every single catalog and trying to get off of them. And sometimes it's hard, because right, the minute you buy something again from that place, like you get another catalog, right? Um, but, but it's a start. Um, and another thing, that, another website you can get off of is those the Valpac coupons, you know, that blue envelope full of Jiffy Lube and HVAC coupons, right? That's another one that you can go onto their website and you can opt out of getting those. So that was another one that I was like, it's like the yellow pages, right? When we used to get those, you could actually get off of that list and not get them. I always hated it. Like I lived in an apartment, and they would like bring like 50 of them, and like nobody wanted those things, you know. But the more that we refuse, the less these companies will think that they have to send them out. And then reduce. So I'll get to the ice cream part, but um, reduce is about choosing quality over quantity. So things that are repairable versus disposable. And there's a website that I share on there called buymeonce.com. And it's a place where you can look at um, ratings of different products and seeing how good of quality they are, what kind of warranties they have. For example, um, like North Face or Patagonia, they're kind of expensive companies, right? Expensive coats, but they stand by their products. So that you know, once if you need a repair or something's you know ripped or whatever, they'll um, repair them for free. And so you have something that's going to last a lifetime, as opposed to like you know a twenty dollar Costco jacket um, that then you have to buy again the next year. So, um, so that's a good website to kind of look at that. And then it's about avoiding unnecessary purchases. So gifting experiences uh, versus things. So for example, if I'm gonna give a present to uh, a friend for a kid for a birthday party, I try to give like a museum membership or you know a gift card to some place or movie tickets or something that's um, tangible. That's uh, not tangible, but an experience that they can have as opposed to more stuff. And then if you do uh, need something. Practice waiting. So a lot of times, I think in our day and age, everything is so instant, right? You can put something in your cart and literally an hour later, somebody's dropping it off at your door. Um, and so we're not used to waiting for things anymore, but sometimes it's an impulse buy and if you just sit on it for a week and if you still need it after that week, then you know maybe look for an alternative place to get it, right? Think about buying things secondhand. Think about going to Goodwill. Um, I always give the example that one time I needed, I didn't have a liquid measuring cup, right? Like one of those Pyrex things. And I was like, oh, I can go to Target and pay, you know, 15 bucks for one. But let me just go to the Goodwill and see. For 50 cents, I got the same exact thing used. Um, and that way I wasn't having to buy something new. So keeping that in mind. 
And then it's about um, collaborative consumption. And that means borrowing, sharing, libraries, bartering. Um, I think a lot of times we think that we need to own an item, but it's, you, sometimes you just need to borrow it, right? So keeping that in mind, we have all of these social networks now, especially now we've been like all online for two years, right? And you find out that, oh, if I wanna go camping? Like, I don't feel like buying a tent. What if I don't like it? Like, what if you don't know, scare of the dark, right? You can go and borrow a tent from someone. Someone else is gonna have one, right? And so um, those kinds of things, and then they'll keep you in mind for when they need to borrow something. And a lot of libraries are starting like these libraries of things as well. Um, umbrellas if it's raining, or an ice scraper, or those kinds of things. So keep, the, keep that in mind. You don't necessarily have to own the thing, because somebody you know probably has one. So. And then it's about rethinking things. So th considering items, using items that you already have on hand for different purposes as opposed to buying something new. So getting creative, um, like a lot of times now, for example, there's like yogurts that come in these little glass jars, right? And they're so pretty, you don't want to just like throw the jar away. Think about another way to use that. Maybe you can put like, you know, thumbtacks in it or some kind of thing, but being creative about stuff and reusing them for different things. Um, I always remember I went to Cuba when I was in college to study abroad. And because of the embargo, Cubans don't have access to all the things that we do. Um, and so they've found ways to be innovative about the stuff that they do have. So they drive around these cars from the 1950s because they've been able to find ways of using other parts or you know, fixing things or repairing to make it work for them without having to buy new. So um, I always keep that in mind. Like it's possible, but we just, because we live in the United States, we're not used to having to do that, right? So, and then if you're going out for ice cream, you ask for a cone instead of a cup because then it's zero waste but it's not zero calories, so just <laughs> keep that in mind. All right, so then we get to the fun part. This is the show and tell reuse part. So um, I brought some things to, to show you of different products that I use in my home. Um, and you know, again, some of these I've, I have links to um, on the handouts if you know, you're interested, you don't have to buy them, you don't have to get them for where I got them, but just kind of giving you ideas, right, of what you can use. So the first one is uh, cloth grocery bags. So obviously everyone has these, right? I don't have to tell you what this is. Um, this is, you know, a key one if you're if you're using. If you're not using this, this is, you know, the basics, right? Step one. Um, what I like to do is during the pandemic, I know like a lot of grocery stores weren't letting you bring your own bags. So I would just put everything in my cart and then take it out to the car and then bag it in the car as a way to you know get around that. It's hard with like Instacart and all that stuff, right? You don't have any control, but you do what you can. And that's what this whole thing is about, do what you can. Um, if I don't, you know, I always, when I empty my groceries, I just leave these hanging from my door. So the next time I'm gonna go out to the car, I grab them again, they're back in my trunk and that's where they are. <coughs> so, um, so that's a way to use them. And then, um, not just cloth grocery bags, but I discovered these cloth produce bags. So you know those cheap little plastic bags that they give you in the, for, in the produce department? These um, are mesh, reusable, washable. They don't weigh anything. Then um, there's a really great alternative to using those bags um, if you can avoid them. So plus, you know, every third one doesn't even open, right? You know, so this is, this is a lot better. Um, then I have washable sponges. And I have a few different kinds. So, Sponges, you know, tend to get like gross and stinky and then we just throw them out, right? And we open another one that's wrapped in individual plastic, right? These sponges are all washable and you can throw them in your washing machine or you can throw them in the dishwasher even on the top rack. So it's pretty cool. Um, and a couple of them are compostable as well. So once they start getting all raggedy, you can compost them. Um, so there's a few different options. Um, this one is uh, like more of a scrubby one, but it's, it is made out of some kind of plastic, so I don't like it as much. Um, but it is uh, packaged in the U.S. with recycled paper and packed by people with disabilities, so um, it kind of balances a bit it out. But this is a, like a more scouring one, so it's going to last you a little bit longer, but it's not very absorbent. And then this is called a Swedish dish, dish cloth, um, and it's from a company, this one I got from a company called Who Gives a Crap, which I will, they sell this toilet paper, which I'll tell you about a little later. Um, but it looks like kind of hard, but once you get it wet, it's super absorbent, um, and you can use it, I like it for cleaning a lot. Um, these are really great. And then my favorite for like dishes is, this is from a company called ET, it's a Canadian company. Um, and I like it because it has a natural like loofah sponge on this side and then an absorbent side. And these things last forever. It, it looks like kind of tiny and dingy, but it like never gets smelly and it lasts a super long time and it's completely compostable. So a lot of great options and like I said, you can just toss it in the to top rack of your dishwasher and reuse it. Um, handkerchiefs, that's a thing. Probably not a thing during COVID, but it's an option, right? You can just use a cloth handkerchief instead of Kleenexes, but uh, that's a personal choice. 
Um, water bottles and coffee cups, I didn't bring one. Everybody knows what a reusable water bottle and coffee cup looks like, but that's something to keep in mind. I, what I like to do is a lot of um, coffee stores and stuff will let you, will take money off when you bring your own cup, right? And so I like to sort of punish myself if I don't have my reusable coffee cup in the car, then I don't go and stop for coffee, right? So that's a way to keep myself in check and remind myself to go. Plus, keeps your coffee way warmer. I don't know why like we go for these paper cups anyways. It's a lot better option. Containers for food takeout and leftovers. So I think, you know, sometimes we go to a restaurant and then we can't finish our meal. Like, bring your own Tupperware. Who cares, right? Just put your food into your own container and like, you know, you don't have to get the cheap plastic or the styrofoam or whatever. Um, you know, somebody might question it or somebody might look at you and be like, wow, that's a great idea. I never thought of that, right? Just keep one in your car with your bags and then you have it option, that option. Um, lots of reusable beauty items um, exist. So, uh, for example, cotton pads, like makeup removing pads. I get these from Etsy. It's like a website where people with small businesses can sell things. So then you're supporting a small business as well as something that's reusable. And these are just really cute, like little flannel things instead of cotton um, throwaway pads. Uh, these are really cool. This is a company called The Last Swab. Um, I think actually now it's called The Last Object because they've expanded. But these are Q-tips or um, like these little things, right, that you can use. And they all come in different containers. So each one in person in your family can have them. And then you just wash them with soap and water. And they're made out of like some kind of silicone. And it's a way of, you know, eliminating tossing out uh, Q-tip every day when you clean your ears. You know, you're not supposed to stick them in your ears, but we all do it anyway. <laughs> so um, this is kind of cool. And they have one that's like, it has different tips that's for makeup too. So um, you can use it for either way. But it just snaps in this little kind of container. Very cool. The first thing that I ever did when I was even thinking about this was starting to use cloth napkins. Um, and this is like such an easy swap, like nobody should be using paper napkins. Unless you don't have a washing machine, and then I understand, like that would be kind of annoying. But um, this is like, I think we have this idea that using cloth napkins has to be fancy, but it doesn't. Uh, you can, you know, use old clothes and cut them in squares, or like my friend made these, it's just a piece of cloth and she just hemmed them and they look like crate and barrel style. But um, but yeah, I mean, this is another way, like go to Goodwill, get some cool fabric, make your own. Um, and if you're with your family, you know, you can use them a few times before you have to wash them. Um, and it's just a really, I mean, they're more absorbent. You use less, right, than the, pa the paper ones. Super simple swap that I was like, why did I not think of this? Um, but we can all be fancy at all times. Um, and then return, oh, if you're worried about water, um, it takes eight gallons of water to make one paper plate. And an energy efficient dishwasher uses three to five gallons of water for an entire load of dishes. So the water argument is not valid. I think most of us have efficient um, appliances. Um, and then return. So you can think about returning, for example, hangers to the dry cleaners when you're done with them so that those can be reused or containers to the farmer's market so that things can get another life and you're not just tossing them up. Or your rain boots to planters, you know, whatever. Um, so then we get to recycle. So we all know about recycling, right? Um, but there are some items that are not recyclable within our uh, your municipal or residential program. Um, plastic bags, for example, and other cellophane-like materials, so anything that's kind of like crumply um, and plastic, you can take it to Target or Jewel or other major grocery stores. Um, and those things, what happens is there's a company called Trex that makes decking, like decks outside in your yard, um, and they use that plastic to make the material, it's called a composite decking or something. Um, and so they go, they have deals with all the grocery stores and pick up those bags. And so it's not, it's good because it's not just a plastic bag, but the wrapping that comes around your paper towels or whatever else. So thinking about that, it has to be clean. Um, and then somebody asked me about Ziploc bags, and apparently if you cut the zip part of them off, then the other part, um, as long as it's clean, can also be included in there. Um, so, and even I think the Amazon packages, the, the plasticky envelopes, so a lot of things, so not just plastic bags. Um, contact lenses. So Bausch & Loam is a major contact lens company and they have a recycling program where you can recycle the actual lenses and the little blister packs that they come in. So a lot of us, if we use dailies, for example, you have you know, every day two little packages and plus the two lenses. Um, and so you can actually put all of those together in one bag, the lenses and the blister packs, and you don't even have to separate the foil completely off, throw it all together. And then there's a bunch of optometrists that collect those, um, the, all of those uh, waste from those, and they send them into Bausch and & Lomb and they get recycled. 
And if you don't have an optometrist nearby that does that, you can actually go online and get a um, free label and ship them yourself. But I prefer like to have a big bunch. So like I try to like be the person at the office that collects them from everybody and then ship it or that kind of thing. So you're not being inefficient shipping things all the time. Um, but I thought that was very cool. Um, and then there's a website called TerraCycle, and they have a lot of like specialized individual recycling programs. And some of them you have to pay for, but some of them are free. Um, everything from candy and snack wrappers to Gillette razors, even Swiffer pads. Like if you, they have you dry them out, and then you can send them in, and they'll recycle those. Um, I do have a link on my uh, page about um, reusable Swiffer pads that are washable, which is a better option. But if you're still using like the ones, or you have some left over, that's a good option. So there's a lot of cool ones to check out. Some of them are like local places have a big box. Like our local Subaru dealer, for example, collects um, coffee cups, the like a Starbucks cup, which is not generally recyclable because it has like a wax coating in it, um, and like the little stirrers, for example. So there's a very individualized kind of uh, program. So if you go on the website, you can kind of find what's nearby and what options there are. But it's very cool. But again, you know, recycling, there's a reason it's closer to the second half of my presentation because we want to try to stop the waste before we get to this point, right? Um, and then obviously there's lots of local specific recycling programs. If you go onto your own village's website, a lot of times they'll have, you know, paint recycling or electronics or shoes or textiles, that kind of thing. I've, there's where I live in Skokie, we have a textile recycling program and they actually come and pick up, when they pick up your garbage and recycling, they have a special orange bag and you can put any kind of clothing or cloth. It doesn't have to be anything, like it could be something like ratty that you wouldn't be able to reuse or it can be clothes that somebody could wear again and you just put it all together and they sort through it um, and things that are not reusable again will get recycled and the other things will have a new life so it's kind of cool um, and you can always ask your municipality to add those kinds of programs too and it's free so very cool and I included the link to that in the handout as well so then rot. Uh, rot has to do with composting. So there's a couple of um, options with composting. There's backyard composting where you have a container in your backyard and you have to put in um, like a combination of brown things and green things and there's like a balance and you have to turn it and it takes time, right? And you can't put just anything in it. And that's one option if you want to go that route. I do something called uh, uh, commercial composting um, and it's the program that I work with or the company that I use it and do it through is called Collective Resource which is a woman-owned company from Evanston and they service um, even this area you can go on their website and they'll show like the whole service area you have to pay for it but what it is is they have like a big orange Home Depot bucket that you just put outside your house it can be composted so bones um, dryer lint, like, you know, you if it was alive with at any point in time, you can compost it. So that's a lot more than what you can do in your own backyard. And you just collect everything into the bucket, and once a week or every two weeks, however you want to set it up, they come take it away and give you a new bucket. So it's super easy, and that alone has reduced the amount of garbage that I'm throwing out in my house by so much. I think we, this week, I'm a family of four, and each week, I think we only have one bag of garbage for the whole house, you know. So um, it's pretty good. Everything that we're recycling and all the stuff that we're composting, it just feels good to like, I don't know, toss like all those pineapple cores like in something you know that it's going to become dirt as opposed to just getting into the garbage. Um, so that's one option. Our village <coughs> subsidizes that program, so um, they pay a bit, large portion of it, and then we pay a smaller amount. So that's also something that you can talk to your village about getting started. They're working with Morton Grove, Skokie, and Evanston right now to provide that service subsidized. And otherwise, you pay for it on your own and you can use it privately. And a lot of restaurants do it too. Um, so, and some people say, well, won't my food scraps just biodegrade? Like, you know, remember those charts in school where they would show you like, oh, you know, a banana peel will take one week or, you know, whatever, plastic takes 100 years. Well, it will if the conditions are right. Unfortunately, in our landfills, they're way too overcrowded for trash to be able to biodegrade. <coughs> Plus, we're throwing everything out in a plastic bag, right? So it has to break down the plastic bag before it even gonna get to the garbage that's inside. So they did a study at the University of Arizona that uncovered 50-year-old newspapers that were still readable 25 year old hot dogs, corn cobs, and grapes. That's pretty gross <laughs> that you can still tell that it's a grape after 25 years. Like, you know, there's grapes in the bag that look bad after a week, right? 
So, you know, those things to keep in mind that it's not just because you're throwing it out in the garbage you think that it'll break down and that's not necessarily going to happen. Com the conditions have to be right. And that's why throwing out something that's compostable in the garbage, like a compostable pl plate or whatever, it has to actually be going through a composting process. Otherwise, there's no point. So some other ideas of things I brought um, are tree-free products. So um, obviously trees are not a very good sustainable resource. They take a long time to grow. We're deforesting everywhere, which is obviously causing all kinds of other issues in terms of climate change and things like that. So um, bamboo is a really good sustainable option. And um, I have a couple of examples. So this is a bamboo paper towel, but it's like indestructible. Like this also can come on, a, just comes on a roll like a paper towel, but just like the sponges, you can throw it in your dishwasher, you can throw it in the wash, reuse it I think up to like a thousand times. Um, and this one's like a lot more soft and like an absorbent kind. But even at Costco now, they have bamboo paper towels that are more like your general paper towel that you're used to. Um, and obviously those are compostable. So um, really good option. It's a, you know, all these things cost a little bit more than the regular stuff, but you're not killing old growth forests. So it's worth it in my mind. Um, but that's a really cool tree free product. And then this toilet paper, this is this company I was telling you that's called Who Gives a Crap? And it's from Australia. And they donate 50% of their profits to build toilets all over the world. Uh, it's 100% recycled, or you can buy a bamboo version. Um, bamboo is a little bit more expensive, uh, but I think it's just as good, this one. Um, still three-ply and all that, no inks, no dyes. And they all come, comes in like 48 rolls in a box, a cardboard box. They're all individually packaged like this. My kids love it when it's toilet paper day because they like play with those things, like build structures and all that. So it has like a lot of uses. They even like have on the box like ideas that you can build them, you know, things out of the box. Um, but I really like them. And even during the great toilet paper shortage of 2020, my subscription still kept coming. Like they they stand by their stuff um, and they do all the carbon offsets and all that kind of thing. So um, I really like this this company. And they also do paper towels and Kleenex and. Um, that's where I got these too. So worth checking out. Um, I really like them for tree-free things. Um, what other tree-free things did I have in here? Oh, uh, bamboo toothbrushes. That's also an, a very cool thing. Uh, the, the bristles are still going to be nylon, but when you're done, you can snap off the handle and the handle can be composted. So that's kind of cool. Um, food wrap. So there's beeswax wraps that you can use instead of saran wrap. I haven't tried them, but a lot of people swear by them. That's a kind of a good option. Um, aluminum foil, for example, never breaks down. Like, you can recycle it if you wash it and clean it, um, but otherwise, that's one of those things that never goes away. So, um, And then plastic-free detergent. So uh, I use this one that's called Drops, D-R-O-P-P-S, um, and they, it comes in just this little like paper cardboard box, which is obviously compostable. Um, and they're just a little pods that you toss in, and they have both detergent pods and fabric softener pods, so we can get away from using those dryer sheets um, just as good. This and these dryer balls that are like wool, but you can get, people ask me, are they vegan ones too? I'm sure there are, but it's just, you toss these in and they kind of jump around in your dryer, um, and there you go. So this is, these are really great options. They just come in the mail like this. Um, and they have all kinds like unscented, sensitive skin, whatever. I'm a runner, and so I have to wash my clothes every day, otherwise no one would want to live with me. And these things are, they do the job. So I like them a lot. They have, there's other companies, there's ones that are like sheets and some other kind of stuff. That's just the one I use, but there's, just so you know that that exists and is an option. Um, bar versus liquid soap and shampoo, I think, during COVID, everybody got obsessed with using liquid like soap all the time. I don't know, but the bars are just as good. Uh, I think we forgot that those existed. And then there's uh, shampoo bars as well and conditioner bars. This one comes wrapped in paper, but there's a company called Lush, and they sell just the bar, and you can buy like a little tin to keep it in. Um, and that's you know much better than a giant Costco-sized plastic bottle, right? And they work just as well. Um, so don't use my hair as a judge because I just don't know how to do hair, but. But otherwise, they do clean, so that's good. Um, oh, and you can always make your own. Like, a lot of people make their own soap and detergent and stuff. That's not my jam, but other people, if you have the time to do that, we, I guess we should have started doing that maybe in 2020, but that's also an option. So lots of ideas here. Um, where to get started, right? 
So one of the things you can do just kind of see what change in your house will give you the most bang for your buck and the most impact is to do what's called a waste audit. So this is an example, for example, if for a week you kind of take note of what are the most things that you're throwing away um, and what you could change to have the biggest impact. So this person uses like a lot of paper towels, right? So they're like, hmm, maybe I should switch to bamboo, you know, maybe I should start composting so I know I'm not throwing those things away. Um, Q-tips, clearly they could benefit from one of these less swaps. Um, food scraps, composting, another good idea. And then just being creative, like, oh, why are you using all these jello cups? Like, you could just make a big thing of jello and put it in your own containers, right? So just getting creative. So that's a kind of good way to look at your own household. What am I throwing out a lot? So what, I, what is the one thing I could start with that would make a biggest um, impact? Um, you can do a 31 day zero waste challenge. This website, goingzerowaste.com, she's written books on zero waste, she's really great, um, has a lot of great ideas, and that 31 day challenge just has like a little video every day of like a different kind of thing you could do um, to give you some ideas. You can um, calculate your ecological footprint. If you're already depressed that day, don't recommend it. <laughs> uh, but it does kind of tell you like how how many Earth's worth resources you are using, and it's very eye-opening and also can kind of help you like okay, what are the things I'm doing that are the worst? Um, and then 100 steps to a plastic-free life is where I got a lot of these ideas too. So just another great website to check out. So um, the idea is this. You don't need a handful of people doing zero waste perfectly. You need millions of people doing it imperfectly. So we all have to just make small little changes in our lives and it all adds up to something as opposed to trying to do it all ourselves, right? Um, there's this little graph here that, you know, trying to get to 100% zero waste shopping, like, but in the meantime, you could be using a reusable coffee mug and getting fruit and veggie bags, right? And there's these other little steps that we can take and not be the little fox crying because there was a sticker on her banana, right? Just like <laughs> doing what we can. And these are things that we can do as individuals, right? But it's not all on us. There's a lot that has to happen on a larger scale. All of these things will help influence, like the more of us that stop buying the peppers in the plastic bag, right? Or whatever, that's all gonna make an impact, um, you know, money-wise. But there's, you know, big companies that are behind a lot of this. So there's an article that I share in my handout there was a cruise that Greenpeace did um, with major companies like Dow and Procter and Gamble and Coca-Cola, and they made them go out to that big, great garbage patch that's in the ocean and snorkel in it and see, like, this is your doing, right? These are your plastics that are floating around in here. And it was really eye-opening to these CEOs um, that were then had to come up with ways of, like, making a change to the way that they package their products. So more things like that have to happen. And related to that, there's a really cool initiative now called the Great Ocean Cleanup. If you look on Instagram, they have um, a page and I'm pretty sure they have a website. But they've come up with this system where they have these two boats and like this system of nets and they're basically going to the great big garbage patch and like collecting a whole like chunk of it. I'm talking tons and tons and tons, like literal tons, and they dump it all on the deck of the ship and they're able to sort through it and recycle all the plastics and, and take care of it. And it's it's doing something, right? It is an effort, but like I said earlier in the presentation, like we have to stop that stuff from getting in. Like that's not a solution. We're not gonna be able to clean that stuff up forever. Um, but it's great to see that there's some technology being developed up there. So, um, so definitely check it out. The videos are very cool and they're doing this in rivers, in the ocean, in different places, trying to make that technology work for different areas. So very cool stuff happening. So that's the end of my presentation.